we're going to go ahead and continue with today's training on the on the rentals and preparing a lease agreement. So let me go ahead and pull up the screen again. I'm sorry for the I apologize for that. And you're also going to need uh, the, some of the standardized disclosures. I talked to you about adding the uh, water heater smoke detector. You're also going to need the carbon monoxide uh, disclosure with the water conserving plumbing devices. I'm adding that in. You're also going to need, because if it's an older property, you're also going to need the lead based paint. That's called FLD. And I'm also going to need a MIMO inspection, move in, move out. I'll just go ahead and add that in. I also like to include the lease rental mold disclosure in my leases. Lease rental mold, add that in. And what else do I have missing? Um, that's pretty much what you need just to start and do the rental agreement. So we have a lot right there. So what I'm gonna go do is start filling out this rental agreement. You can see what forms that I need over here. And I'm also gonna need the earthquake booklet, which I'll show you where to get it real quick. You change out of your CAR library, go into your California EPUBs. I'm gonna go ahead and grab all of these rental agreements, uh, the earthquake environmental. So I need all six of these. Okay, and I add them in. Or you can go to my drive and I have it easily there for a combine so you have all of them in one place. So it's up to you how, how you want to do it. So now that I have everything that I have to send over to the clients, there's six of these disclosure things, but we all know, I'll show you what it is. This is the earthquake disclosure one where they have to talk about whether it's braced, uh, uh, bolted to the foundation, you know, is this, is it, is it a strapped, uh, you know, all the stuff that is supposed to be done for uh, earthquake safety. So we need this form along with the receipt. Okay, so that's where you find it, showing you where it is. And ultimately when we go into the lease, we prepare, this is the date prepared, assuming I'm preparing it today, I'm going to call this landlord, uh, landlord John Smith. That's the, that's the landlord. I'm going to call this because I've inputted the MLS information already, it's going to fill in the address. And then, uh, I'm going to know who are my tenants on this page here, because on the application to rent, they're going to tell me it's going to be with Sally, uh, Jane and their, and, child uh austin you could write nine years old uh and and that's going to be a, a family i don't know whatever you want to talk about so you write all their names in here those are going to be considered the residence tenants okay even if you write the children's name on here yes okay now you also write any personal property that's going to be included. Uh, in this case, let's say the HOA and let's say the, uh, the condo has a washer and dryer and refrigerator included with lease uh, with no warranty by landlord. Okay. So that just means that we're including maybe the washer and dryer, but the uh, uh, tenants to maintain the, the, the equipment with no warranty. And I'll, 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 I can address this later on as well. If I'm representing a landlord, I'm, I'm going to be writing this contract up to protect the landlord, my client, correct? So this premises may be subject to a local rent control ordinance. If this was Arcadia, this is Arcadia, so there's no rent control ordinance here. But if this was Pasadena, I might write there's a Pasadena rent control ordinance because, for example, you could write it here. Pasadena rent control uh, ordinance that they have a special uh, thing where, you, you know, they have a special uh, cap on the rent amount and uh, just cause eviction if you have to evict the tenant. You have to pay them some compensation. Okay, but I'm in Arcadia, so I don't need that here, but uh, I would put it for other cities that do have one. Then you write the commencement date. This is the day the lease starts. 
And I'm assuming we're gonna start mid-month right here, September 15th. It makes no difference. It's just you, you talk to and communicate what is their, on their application, they will write a proposed start date. And assuming this tenant is assume, assuming they are wanting 915. I put in here, this is a lease term. Typically, our leases should terminate one year. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it as September 14th. 2021 that will give them a one-year lease and let's say I wanted to expire at 2 p.m. you can put whatever time in here that is when they had to deliver the possession back to the, the landlord or renew their uh, agreement month to month and this rental uh, was I think around eighteen hundred dollars a month so I just put in it doesn't really matter I'm just gonna put in eighteen hundred dollars whatever's on their application and whatnot you can have the rent payable on the first of the month. That's what most landlords like. And the rent shall be paid. I talked to the landlord and I asked them, how do you want to get paid? Do you want to get check, cashier's check? Uh, most check people are okay with that or they like wire transfer into their accounts. Um, sometimes they like cashier's check, that's fine too. And you write in the name of the landlord who is this person's name was John Smith. So they want it paid to John Smith. That's, that's how you follow the instructions. So you write clear instructions. That's what you want to do. Um, and in this instance, if they were to be delivering it to a, uh, a specific wire, uh, then you could, you could also say, you could write in the address of where to deliver. So that's put it here. Or, uh, uh, bank account direct deposit and you could write in here that they could write a uh, bank or you just write a, you know if they're going to deliver by uh, wire transfer then you can give them your wire information separately on a piece of paper to be provided at a later date whatever you like Okay, whatever your landlord likes, I'm sorry. Kevin, Kevin. Yes. Yeah, um, for my experience, the lawyer say don't let them do the direct deposit or wire. Just in case they don't have uh, the money to pay the rent, if they have your account, they just do the $10 or 100 into your bank, yep. and then, then you cannot evict them. And, yeah, because they made uh, a partial payment. Yeah, so I so. I, I I did attend sessions where the attorneys don't like people to go yeah. into your why uh, direct deposit into your account, especially yeah. if it's a personal or a big large account savings account. Yes, uh, if it's a separate account just for this property, maybe. But the reason yeah. you said is accurate. Yes, uh, uh -huh. they have the ability to do partial payments or. Uh, they may not, uh, uh, you know, they could potentially uh, deduct against your account by trying, you know, because they know your information and they want to go in a lawsuit against you. They can try to uh, have someone deduct. There's, there, there is, there is valid reasons why you don't want them to. Sure, right, exactly. So I agree with you, but let, again, like I told you, you have to follow uh -huh. the instruction. So uh -huh. you're following the client's instruction and they tell you they want it to their bank account, uh, all you can do is just give them some guidance and give them an article why it's not a good idea to go to your bank account. But if they still want uh -huh. and instruct you as a listing agent to give it to their account, you follow their instruction. Yeah, right? I understand. Yes. So yes. Uh -huh. to me, you go ahead and send it to an address and never send it to the office. You send it to their a, the, to the landlord's address or their PO box because you don't want to yeah. be the one handling any money as a company. We don't want to have any trust fund responsibility. So I have a broker rule policy, no rent checks to be delivered to the office and the agents yeah. should not be handling this rent money. So you send it yeah. to the landlord directly or deposit into their account directly, whatever the landlord yeah. prefers. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank and, you. Uh, so then that, that answers that good point on the uh, no direct deposit to the bank account. Um, 
and then you fill in the information. Security deposit typically is one to two months of the annual monthly rent. So one to two months, uh, in this case at 1800, it could be, let's say, $3,600 up to this amount. And this will be transferred to and held by the landlord, the owner, okay? Most bro owners, brokers, uh, you know, us, we never want to hold any trust account or any security deposit. So don't check this box here. So uh, this already says that security deposit will not be returned until tenants have successfully vacated the premises, all keys returned. And uh, they have, a landlord has 21 days to deliver back the security deposit to the tenant after they successfully did their move out and delivered full possession. This is according to California Civil Code 1950.5. All right. Now, when you fill this out under move-in costs, typically I do not want the move-in cost to be the personal check because I don't want the check to bounce. So I don't know if they have sufficient funds. I don't know if they have you know, all this money being transferred or I don't want to stop payment. I want a cashier's check uh, for the moving funds. And the rent period from 9.15 to 9.30 is half a month's rent. So I'm going to ask for 900 bucks. Then I'm going to also ask for October rent. And I'm going to include 1800 month. And security deposit. Remember, we're doing two months on this one. So I'm going to ask for 3600 And uh, I'll put the due date due by the, let's say I'm going to do all the possession. I, I can have it all due by the 15th. If that's the day I'm going to move in and I'm going to have them uh, bring in their funds. I want it all by then. And there are other types of deposits you can collect. Uh, you could do a key deposit. Maybe you're giving them garage remotes. Maybe you're giving them keys to the HOA as well, like keys to the HOA. and all these other types of remotes, maybe there's a value of like, you know, cause if there's a re keys are replaced for the pool house or for the clubhouse, they charge you a replacement cost. So you might want to ask for, I don't know, 200 bucks plus the garage remotes, another hundred. So you might want to ask for 300 bucks for the key deposit also have that due. Okay. And so this tenant is going to have a total of, uh, you know, a lot of rent right now, but that's because I'm charging two months in advance and I'm also charging October in advance because we're starting halfway. Does that make sense? Okay, and I want this cashier's check payable to whom? So I would probably put John Smith. Or you could also write the company name for, for this purposes when you the moving costs. Our company does accommodate the uh, rental uh, moving costs, and then we could write a separate check to the to the seller, to the landlord, and to the uh, other uh, realtor for their commission. So we could do that for you guys as well. So you can uh, your choice. Just talk to me if you uh, if you have questions on that. Late fee. It really depends on what you want. Uh, normally, I see a lot of times somewhere between fifty to eighty bucks. So I'll just call it, let's say $60 for a late fee and um, parking. Uh, in this HOA, uh, parking is specifically, um, you would write in any instructions. So let's say two parking spaces. Uh, and then I would specify uh, reserved for unit, uh, you, you, you know, reserved for space number 100 and 102, whatever. Sometimes they have a little space reservation. Sometimes they have their own private parking. So it's, uh, it's easy to understand. I'm giving you an example where there's a carport and they have specific spaces, a hundred and then 102 is the spaces that are, are included in the rent. 
Now, if you're dealing with a property in downtown LA or the west side or in the beach area, you don't have to necessarily give them free parking. Maybe I want to charge them is not included in the rent. And if you want to have parking, you got to pay me an extra $200 per month. You could do that. Your parking is separate from the unit. And if I was near downtown LA or the beach side, I can make more money renting out my, my space to the neighbor, or I can give to this tenant for 200 bucks, their choice. So uh, I'm just giving you some ideas how to protect or how to add value for your landlord. In this situation, we're in Arcadia, so parking is not a premium, there's plenty of parking. I'm gonna go ahead and have it included and storage as well. Storage is permitted as follows, uh, personal property only. Uh, if I'm dealing with a, a space that has a yard or a lot of uh, uh, storage space, um, I might exclude certain things. No storage outside in yard. Uh, or I might have a specific storage uh, container for all of my tools and my gardening equipment. Maybe I'm a landlord that has some extra stuff in, in, a, in a separate storage yard. Storage, storage uh, I could say something like the storage uh, container in rear is excluded. You know, stuff like that. You could, you could write that in here. You could also charge for storage if you wanted to, just like the parking above. But I'll just go ahead and just keep this like that. And if you're going to charge them, then go ahead and in here. To me, you would want to put this as here, except for tenants' personal property contained entirely within the premises, no storage is permitted on the premises. If I'm a landlord, I would like to see this checkbox here. I don't want them making the neighborhood look ugly or they store a lot of auto equipment, tires, uh, a lot of stuff in the backyard that could be contamination like oil and other uh, uh, potentially hazardous stuff. Tenant pays for all utilities and services by default and the following charges. Let's say the tenant in this situation for the apartment, they have to pay for all utilities and services and the following charges. Um, in this case, it could be Maybe I want to pay for, um, maybe I have uh, a, a, a certain service, like uh, what's a service that they could be, it, it could be internet. And then except for HOA fees and land, uh, landscaping. Okay, in this condominium, the HOA takes care of it and the landlord will take care of the HOA fees and, and the landscaping is, is done for the tenant. Okay, uh, there's, you would check this box if you're dealing with a uh, duplex or a triplex, but this HOA, they all have their own separate meters in this kind of condominium. And I would check all that apply regarding the condition. So I would check tenant acknowledges everything is clean and operable. I would allow the tenant to fill this part out if there's anything not operable, not clean. And then I also tell the tenant to give me a memo form and I'll deliver to them. Uh, hopefully I'll give it to them on the first day. So yeah, within three days, sure. Okay. And they have three days to give back to me their memo telling me anything in regards to the condition that's broken or not uh, anything that the tenant does not want to be responsible for one year later. They should notate anything that's called pre-existing defects, pre-existing problems, things are not working, maybe the air conditioning is not blowing cold air, and they should tell the landlord, hey, can you get this addressed? Can you get this fixed? I don't want to be responsible for this in uh, one year down the line. So this memo is very, very important for every single rental that you do. Include this form so that the tenant uh, makes a statement of what's good, what's not good. 
it's for both the landlord and tenant's protection. And, um, and you could write condition of something else. Like, uh, remember I told you about the washer and dryer? I would write something like this. I would write that the washer and dryer refrigerator are they're provided as a as a courtesy, but no guarantee from landlord. Tenant shall maintain appliances at their own expense. Okay. So that's something to protect the landlord um, if you want to. And sometimes some, some landlords are very nice and they'll, they'll take care of it. But to me, I just rather have not had the responsibility. In this case, uh, I would just go ahead and be, I would probably just go ahead and say HOA maintains the exterior landscaping of the community. And I would charge no landlord or tenant and leave it blank. And uh, same thing, copy, paste, okay? And then maybe I have specific uh, things that I want the tenant to maintain. So I could put it here. So tenant shall maintain, for example, maybe I have, uh, I know that the, the, the HVAC, HVAC system I could put the responsibility of the H air conditioning to the tenant here. If I don't write anything here, it's this is technically a landlord responsibility, but uh, I can try to push off that responsibility to the tenant by putting it into the contract. Okay. And then I will, because I told them that I, the landlord does not want responsibility for any warranty, I would include the washer and dryer statement again, right here. Okay, I don't necessarily, I could take it off of here and under condition and I could just write it in here. There's nothing, no harm in duplicating it, uh, but this is the appropriate area when you wanna provide something without warranty. If there is pets, then you should attach this form and there's now a pet addendum added to the contract. It automatically says no smoking of any kind and um, go ahead and just leave it blank. Unless you want to allow smoking, then you can, you can check the box and say smoking of any uh, certain substances are allowed. Gene asked a question. It automatically says that tenant agrees to comply with all landlord rules and regulations. So provide them some rules and regulations. You should, if in the HOA, uh, check this box um, and I would check number two they've been provided with and give them the rules and regulations up front right in the beginning prior to signing the lease okay uh, so I would probably check this box and give them a copy if I don't have it yet then I would check this box and I would give it to them within five days later um, or or in Jean's instance I could write tenant to order the rules you could try to push it off to the tenant at least you've mentioned it here so that if there is a breach or a violation you have a contract that states that the tenant is supposed to be responsible all potential violations from HOA, okay? I would maybe write a statement like that if I want to push off this responsibility to a tenant. I'm just making you think about when you fill this out, don't just go blank, 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 blank. 
write in the rules and write in specifics if there are specifics that you should be doing to protect your client. And because this is an HOA, I'll go ahead and write it in here. And we would write the name as a, I don't know what the name is right now, but you can always uh, look it up or talk to the owner and look at the owner's statements and their monthly HOA minutes. It'll tell you what the name of the HOA. I just call it Fairview HOA uh, Community. And so that way they are responsible, tenants shall reimburse landlord for any fines or charges imposed by the HOA. Okay, but certain times the tenants don't read this, so they don't know. That's why I like to write it in to duplicate and make sure and ensure if I have to collect, I can prove that it's been mentioned several times to the tenant. That's, that's the whole purpose of why I'm writing this up for my landlord. And I will deliver a copy of the HOA rules within, let's say, five days. And I would give them and check off the copy of the HOA rules and regulations for pets, for nuisances, for time, all that stuff that's going on with the HOA. And tenant acknowledges or will receive, write down how many keys, let's say two keys to the front door. You're going to get one key to the mailbox and you're going to get one key to the common area. Uh, which is the pool and the and the uh, to the comment whatever and maybe you get one key one key one garage remote and maybe you also have one of those cool HOAs that has one uh, key fob to enter the front premises and there's sometimes they have a key fob there and then you acknowledge that the keys have not been rekeyed. And because normally the landlord does not rekey. I do not like tenants to assign or sublet the property. Um, so if you don't want them to do that, you should specify specific instructions. Okay, so specific instructions could be written here. Tenant is prohibited from subleasing or assigning this lease agreement. No short term rentals or air B and B business rentals allowed. And I would write other rules than that I have, but this has been a problem um, in many recent years where people would rent a place and start uh, subleasing it or renting it out for a few days. And so I don't want any of that. I don't want my property being used as a business. So um, no business activity allowed. Okay. So I would write specific instructions that I want to add to this agreement in here. If you don't have enough space, because you maybe your landlord is very picky and has a, or maybe they have an attorney, then you're gonna write and check off and write C addendum, and then attach an addendum with a list of everything that they want to write in. If they have more than you know these three three lines, I agree. This is not a lot of space. So if if it was my property, I would write an addendum and put down all the rules one two three four five six seven eight nine ten, and put all the rules that I want the tenant to meet, like tenant to provide copy of their renter's insurance, tenant to deliver um, you know, rent uh, on time every single month to a specific address or you know, I can give them all these instructions that I want. So that's the area you go ahead and put it. Um, I'm gonna talk and go back into the rental agreement right here. What are the tenant's obligations when they leave? They have to provide it in the same condition when they received it, clean, from any uh, standard, uh, 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 you know, you know, whatever the same condition. So remove all debris, and you put the address for the landlord here. And then maybe you're asking for liability insurance. So if you are, you should check this box and ask for them to have liability insurance for the amount of, I don't know, one hundred thousand. You could make it 200,000, whatever it is, and providing landlord 
as an additional name insured. So that way, if there's someone injured or someone's a mover falls and trip and falls, or maybe someone is leaning on the balcony and they fall over and, 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 and get uh, seriously hurt in the emergency room, guess what? You wanna have that liability insurance in place. So that will protect a little bit if there's any claims. Um, I do not like or have or want water uh, beds or any portable washers like this. So um, I can probably exclude it. These are where notices are should be delivered. This is the landlord's e uh, address and this is gonna be where the tenant should get their notices. Um, you know, that's, that should be filled out. You need to have an area where, no, where notices are delivered. And because this is a property built before 1978, I checked this box. I checked that uh, I would maybe ask that the tenant be responsible for a periodic pest control. I don't necessarily want the landlord to be responsible for it, although it could be very normal if it's a single family. And I checked the earthquake booklet because I am sending it over to them like I already showed you. And everything else is already filled out. In this case, the listing agent is Henry and then ABC Realtor is representing the tenant. Okay. And I fill out their information there. And because it's one year or longer, you check the box that there is an agency disclosure required. And again, this is where you put in any other rules. Like um, I've seen stuff in here like uh, landlord will deduct $300 for cleaning fee at, um, uh, at, at Maybe that's a landlord that, that wants to do the cleaning themselves and they're gonna charge $300 for the cleaning fee. Uh, but sometimes I, you can do that. Uh, you could write any other instructions about pets, about uh, you know specific rules or see attached HOA, uh, rules and regulations, no noise, or I've seen stuff like no, uh, no visitors shall uh, live on property for longer than five days without landlord consent. Okay. So stuff like that, you could think, you know, there's a million things that could be thought of, but uh, the things that your landlord wants, uh, go ahead and write it in. So the property is being managed by who? Okay. Never write listing firm or the leasing firm because we are not the management company. Okay, so uh, so the real estate broker, the property manager, you don't. There's I would leave it blank, or go ahead and write landlord John Smith is self managing the condo. Okay, so that way it specific, specifically does not name our company as the property management and the tenant's name and information goes here. A lot of people ask me what the heck is a guarantee? I have uh, basically situations where, uh, and here are the common examples, but typically when there is a, ten a tenant and they do not have strong income or they do not have strong FICO scores, or they do not, or they're not a citizen and they're, they're foreigners. Uh, a lot of times, these people could be good tenants, but they do not have the uh, financial uh, evidence that proves that they're rent worthy. So, if you want, you could uh, check this box. And as a landlord, I would like to see there's a personal guarantee by someone who is credit worthy. So if you could have someone guarantee this lease, what that puts them is they are also equally liable and responsible for the payment of the monthly rent 
and delivery of the possession in its same condition back to when it expires. When you have this, it's very strong for the landlord to go after any damages or repairs that are needed when there's a dispute or a disagreement on the condition later on. And or when there's a lack of payment. For example, during COVID, there are people who are in tenants trying to get out of the rent payments, but when there's a guarantee, uh, this guaranteed person is going to convince and persuade the tenant to make their payments because they do not want to make these payments for, for, the, for the people who are trying to use this as an excuse. Uh, when do I see this happen a lot? I see guarantees happening a lot when it's a foreigner. They don't have American financial institutions or credit or FICO scores or social security being built up. Um, so they're not very credit worthy. So then to get the place, they would ask someone who is uh, credit worthy to help guarantee them for the lease. Another instance is when there's a student or young people who do not have a full-time job, maybe the parents want to help them with their rent and help them get into the, the, the space and have, uh, you know, maybe they're going to like uh, Pasadena City College or they're going to a community college and they're out of the area. The, the, the parents typically are willing to guarantee the payment of the mortgage for their student who has no job. So that's normal. That's a very reasonable circumstance. And when you have a guarantee, you are uh, helping the landlord have a credit worthy person be attached to this lease agreement. You fill in your company information here. And let's talk a little bit about what's called new standard disclosures required for rentals in California. Bed bugs is a required disclosure that says that the tenant shall report any infestations to the landlord and that uh, there is a potential that there is bed bugs on the property. And ultimately, the uh, tenant agrees to hold harmless the landlord and agents for any claims regarding bed bugs. So I like this form. It's a mandatory form for both landlord and tenant to read about. The other mandatory disclosure in California is regarding tenant flood hazards. And if this, prop, this property is not located in a special flood hazard or area of potential flooding. However, some areas do have flooding. If you're near a dam, if you're near a high, uh, like a river bank or an area that the, the uh, NHD report has already disclosed to the owner that you're in a special flood hazard zone, then you check this box, okay? So because of this, the tenant could get their own insurance for the potential uh, responsibility that the dam in Santa Fe Dam might break. And if you have a property in Santa Fe, uh, you, you might want to get extra insurance in the event that there's a water flooding going on, um, that they have insurance for the computers and all the equipment and all the stuff that they have. Okay, this is the most important form that I see the most errors this year. What is rent cap? What is just cause? And when we talk about rentals in California, we're talking about the new statewide rent control, section 1947.2 of the California Civil Code. And we refer to that as the Tenant Protection Act of 2019. First of all, the rent cap means and this is statewide rent control. This applies to all California properties, single family, condos, townhomes, and multifamily, everything that is residential. Now, what it means is the landlord has a requirement of the maximum rent they can charge annually, year after year. It is based upon the gross rental rate of a 12 month period, 5% plus the annual CPI index of the area. And you have to research that online. In LA County, it was around two and a half to 3%. Okay, that's typical. So the maximum you could charge was seven and a half percent greater than it was last year. 
and that was based on the rent of February 15th, 2019. Okay, now that's only if your property is subject to statewide rent control. When we talk about statewide rent control, what are the specific exemptions? Okay, so the exemptions are when you have a housing accommodation where the tenants share a bathroom or kitchen with the owner of the property. So a simple exemption is when I'm doing rooms for rent. If I'm a landlord, I'm living in my own house and I rent out two of my bedrooms to other people, students, or maybe it's a friend, I am exempt from the just cause eviction rules. I'm exempt from the rental caps because I'm living under the same roof, same bathroom, shared, shared kitchen. Or if I have a single family owner occupied residence where the owner occupant rents or leases no more than two units or bedrooms, okay, or an ADU. So what that means is as long as I am not renting uh, a duplex, a triplex, or a quadplex, I am exempt. Okay? So that's what this means. So the other exemption that the owner could be exempt from are these below here. If you have a property like a condominium and is new construction within the past 15 years, then I am also exempt. So if it's a new construction 2008 built, that's within the next last 15 years, then I don't have to, I, I am exempt from statewide rent control. However, three years later in 2023, this condominium that I have may be subject to the statewide rent control because it's no longer qualifies for the 15 year rule. As long if the property is a duplex where the owner unit occupies one of the units, I'm renting out my back unit, then I'm also exempt from this specific rent cap and just cause rule when I'm living on the property and I'm renting out one of the units. Now, if the property is a single family residential property, including condos or a, a townhouse or a PUD, as long as I'm not holding this as a trust, as a REIT, or as a corporation, or as an LLC, then this is automatically exempt. So that's where most people have their rental property. They have a condo duplex, a condo, a PUD, a house, this is the rule that gets most of the people exempted from the rules, unless they're holding it as a corporation or an LLC. So if that is the case, I would check the box. And I see this error so many times where agents are not checking this box and the landlord should be declaring they are exempt. They're holding it as their individual name. It's a single family property. It is a newer building. It's not a, a multifamily. So most of the cases, landlord is exempt. So check this box if it's, this is the case for the landlord. So that way the tenant knows and has been notified with all of these specific rules. Does that make sense? Kevin, so what about the apartment? An apartment is a rental multifamily and it applies. If I'm an apartment older, an owner, I have, let's say, an eight unit apartment Apply. building. Apartment unit, I have eight units. Then this is, ex this is not exempt. I have to give, uh -huh. uh, it, is a, uh, it is required to give them the RCJC. They are subject to rent caps and they are subject to just cause. No matter how I hold title, it's a multifamily. Uh-huh. Easy. The exemption is only but, for single but, family. Uh, uh -huh. and, and I'm confused like if like I'm I'm helping my client to looking for the three units, right? Okay. In LA. Yep. So uh 
the year of the unit is O. Yep. So they want to uh, take it back after they purchase. So, so that would depend. Uh, I, I, I can't hear your question, Jean. Maybe they unit. One unit can be rental out in city So uh you're sp you're speaking about a multifamily building, let's say three units. Right? So so if I I purchase is the three you rental out. So is it this is will be okay. Yeah. Yes. Oh. So if you have a, a family building, I, there's an internet connection weird uh, thing going on. I'm sorry, guys. So if there's three units, it's it is it is considered to be under statewide rent control. It is not exempt. Okay. The only way I can get it exempted is if I tear it down and I build a new multifamily, then it's then a new construction and I make it 2020 year built, then it could be exempted because, I see. okay. Uh -huh. The other way is if I remove a unit and I make that triplex into a duplex, this rule here, if it's a duplex, then I live in one property of it and that owner occupies one, I rent out the back unit, then I can make it exempt. Other than that, it's going to apply no matter how you hold title, even in individual or an LLC, it doesn't matter. Your three unit building will be required to follow statewide rent control. Okay, to me, raising rents by seven and a half percent that's reasonable. Okay, that's more than the CPI. That's there's nothing wrong with raising it seven and a half percent as it was last year, so that's not really that harsh. It's a reasonable increase, seven and a half percent. Got you. Uh -huh. Okay. It's only when they're in a rent control area and like city of LA has highly protected rental ordinances that are more strict than 7.5%. Like city of LA, they might have a more strict ordinance on the statewide rent control board. So that if there's a more local ordinance that's more strict, that applies uh, rather than the statewide rent control rules. The local ordinance trumps. It, it, it's the more, uh, the, the, the proper rules to follow, the local ones. The city of Arcadia doesn't have any uh, a typical you know, local ordinance, okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, what does this, uh, just cause eviction means that's the last thing I'm going to touch before we conclude today. Just cause means the right of the landlord to evict and ask a tenant to vacate the premises after their lease term. Okay, so let's say one year passes, we're going month to month to month for many, many months for maybe two years on my, on my rental with my tenant. If I'm the landlord and all of a sudden I want to use my rental and vacate the property, I have to determine whether there's any at fault or no fault of the tenant. And that is going to determine how do I vacate this tenant. Okay, so easily, if this is a tenant that has been following the rules, and has been uh, paying every single month. It's the same people on the rental agreement. They don't add all these uh, extra people. They don't have any extra pets. They're normal, good people. They're good tenants. That is considered to be, there's no fault at all. There's no fault of the tenant. What that means is that the landlord is asking them to leave. And the, in the event that statewide rent control applies, let's say it's a triplex, if this applies, that means that as they entered into the lease, 
For example, after January 1st, guess what? If the owner asks them to terminate their tenancy to vacate at no fault, okay, owner has to provide the tenant a direct payment of relocation assistance equal to one month of the tenant's rent at the time of termination. So in this case, it's $1,800 a month. The landlord has to give them relocation of $1,800, one month's payment within 15 days of them being asked to leave at no fault. They had no fault. That's a lot of money. In lieu of this direct payment, the owner may waive the payment of one month rent uh, and go ahead and say, you know what, I'm not gonna pay you one month, but go ahead and don't pay me for November's rent. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and waive that. Make sure you vacate the property prior to that date. Okay, so this gives the landlord the ability to waive it in lieu of one month's rent. Okay, so no fault means that they're asking the tenant to leave and they are going to withdraw the premises for the rental market. Maybe I'm going to occupy it for myself. Uh, that's one reason, like, like, like Jean was mentioning. Uh, maybe I'm going to not use it myself. I'm going to give it to my child to live there for us as a student. Um, maybe this property, no fault, means this property has a major, major foundation structural issue. I need to do a major remodel. I need to uh, uh, do a major re renovation and the government has given me a notice to tear it down or maybe take care of a major mold issue. I don't know, this could be a lot of reasons. But if it's deemed to be unsafe and I ask the tenant to leave for substantial remodeling that probably needs a permit, then I have to give them also one month's rent to vacate the property. And then I do my remodeling. Another reason of no fault means that I'm gonna do substantial remodeling, like maybe I'm gonna modernize the two units of I have, and anything that requires a, a structural, electrical, a plumbing permit, maybe I'm gonna improve and build out all the bathrooms, upgrade copper plumbing, change out a new roof, and I'm gonna make this a uh, much, much, much nicer property. Great. A lot of people like to do renovations so that they can charge more rent. So I can do that, but I also have to uh, ask to give them 30 days notice. And I also gonna have to give first opportunity to the tenant to come back to this property after I finished my remodeling, but I could charge them higher rent, okay? Now, the other reason I can vacate the property. Yes. Kelvin. Yeah, so under what situation, I overheard that. Under what situation, uh, uh, the new landlord uh, need to pay the tenant for 20K per unit? If they that, is under LA, that is under LA rules. And LA, like I told you, Los Angeles has a more strict local rent ordinance that's more strict than the statewide California rules. And yes, landlords who vacate a unit that's under rent control will have to pay sometimes $7,000 per person. And if you have five people in there, it can get up to $20,000 plus in order for me to vacate them at no fault. Yeah, read the LA rent control uh, ordinance. And, and that's the city of Los Angeles. That's a city rule. That's not a state rule. There are times it what's considered at fault. And this is the area as a listing agent and a landlord, I want to aim for when I want to vacate a property. So I don't have to pay them one month's rent. So a landlord who's doing a, a good landlord would try to find a reason that's at fault of the tenant in order for me to waive my requirement to give them one month's rent to leave. So what these are the areas that I can legally say the tenant is at fault. If the one, they don't pay the rent. That's easy. They don't pay the rent, they're at fault. 
if they have a material breach of the lease agreement. Uh, so a material breach could be maybe they use it for a business. Maybe they have three, four, uh, five other people that are living there. Maybe they use it as Airbnb. Maybe they are assigning it or sublet leasing it like is mentioning under G for Airbnb. The other reason is C, if they have a problem and are getting notices of nuisance violations from the HOA or from the community or from neighbors or from the police, maybe they start throwing a lot of sofas and trash on the yard and uh, the, no, the, the, people, the city gives them a violation for, for a, a weed abatement or for trash abatement, or maybe they park the vehicles on the grass there's all these types of uh, storage that's illegal storage. To, um, so that's, that, that's considered at fault. Yeah, at fault, okay, it's easy. But I'm talking about like not at fault. Like we are looking for buying three units beside the LA city. So what about other city like Rosemead, like Montebello or other city will be can- Rosemead can and Montebello do not have a local rent ordinance. So you would, uh, they, they apply the statewide, statewide rules apply for those cities. What do you mean the statewide? I don't got it. That was everything that I'm talking to you. Statewide is what I'm talking to you about, uh, just cause and rent caps. This is the statewide rules right here, RCJC. California law, and if you want to learn, learn more about it, read the Tenant Protection Act of 2019. Just Google it. Okay. So for cities that do not have a local ordinance like Montebello, or like you said, Alhambra doesn't have it, or Arcadia doesn't have it, then the statewide rent control applies. And if you're buying a triplex, it applies. Okay? even if they all occupy one. Duplex is the only one where they can get an exemption. So going back, the, uh, the at-fault rules are easily uh, this, um, committing waste. They throw a lot of trash or they have chemicals being uh, thrown onto the land or oil spills and they're throwing, you know, the, they're contaminating the soil. Criminal activity obviously is a, a breach of contract. There shouldn't be any criminal activity going on and you can vacate the property without paying them. Uh, tenant's refusal to allow the tenant to come back and do a standard annual inspection, building safety inspection, or maybe the landlord is trying to sell the property and they refuse to allow entry. That's a violation because the lease agreement says they have to give landlord notice with 24 hours notice, allow landlord access. And if they do it for any unlawful purpose, like maybe some, maybe some tenants are operating a, a business, like they have a birth factory going on that happened to one of my neighbors and they were renting out a property and they were just uh, taking money in for a pregnant woman to live there and that's, that's not, not, not allowed, it's a business, okay? When a tenant fails to deliver possession back to the landlord, um, when the landlord you know, asks on time, that's another violation. So bef to, in order for the, the landlord to exempt themselves from the one month payment, they need to give the client uh, an at fault just cause violation notice that is curable. Give them time to, to, to remedy whatever violation they're doing. And, and that must be first given in, before you can ask them to vacate at, no, at fault. Okay. So I hope I covered this in detail, all of the new rules for the Tenant Protection Act. This is the CAR standard form that's, that the attorneys want the landlord and tenants to read and understand. So that way you're the one that are preparing these contracts. You need to know the differences and check the box when the landlord is exempt. So that way they do not have to follow these very, very tough rules. 
Does that make sense? So this is a time where I'm going to ask if you have any questions about tenants, lease agreements, drafting the contract, procedure, statewide rent control. Any questions you guys have? If no questions, I want to show to you at least one type of resource that I do have. And I hope I have it in here. So uh, Jean was asking for uh, rules on the just cause. I would tell the, the, the landlord to please read this and the agents to read the Tenant Protection Act of 2019. This gives you a summary of what you're supposed to read and understand. And uh, there's another section in here. I'm looking for the CAR website. All right, so guys, I, I'm pulling up my previous slides that talks all about the statewide rent control. So if you wanna learn about this, Gene, or anyone else, uh, go ahead and read the differences because I have, it applies to all multifamily homes. It, I'm giving you the rules for LA County and, 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 C, and, and the different cost of uh, the CPI index. I tell you the difference between rent cap and just cause evictions, these are all uh, uh, proper areas to re understand and the, ex the proper exempt exemptions. Okay. Now, if you want uh, to find out cities that have rent control, okay, then go to this article in here. And I already uploaded this slides to the Google Drive. So it's been in front of you. But if you want, check, click on the link. And these are the cities of, in California with strong rent control measures. And we have locally Los Angeles, like I told you, city of LA, Santa Monica, Palm Springs, West Hollywood, Glendale, and Pasadena has a rental ordinance as well. Okay, so if you wanna read about them, go to this link here and it talks to you about the city of unincorporated of East LA or LA. Uh, these are all the rules that I've already given to you guys and you need to read about it. Like West Hollywood, they have a certain 75% increase. You know, you, you could read about these things that special local ordinances that will apply above and beyond the statewide rent control. Okay. So go to the, go to the drive and you can find this link and all the slides that I just shared with you here. So that's really the end of the training. Um, any questions now, other questions? Okay, well, we spent an hour and 20 minutes together. I'm very happy to have more than 10 of you guys on the call. I appreciate you being here for today's training. I, I hope you learned something about the new California statewide uh, rent control. It's always something to learn and still people and landlords are still trying to understand this, but you as the realtor need to understand all the stuff, uh, whether you're specialized in leasing or not, we need, we need to know what the rules are for our state of California. That's why you guys are called professionals. We call pro uh, brokers and realtors. So um, this is tough. I don't like it as a landlord. I don't like it as a realtor, but it's added rules and requirements for us as professionals to follow and understand, but we don't have to know everything. All we need to do is just give them the guidance, send them my articles, send them the links, and, and at the very least, at least you've given them the information and let the owner 
manage the property the right way in compliance and, uh, and you have evidence that you shared it with them, you have evidence that it's not your fault in the event that they do something wrong or they overcharge. Because I can tell you that a lot of these tenants right now are very smart. They're getting guidance from tenant uh, rent, rent uh, you know, people who are advocates of tenants. Uh, a lot of these groups and community groups are helping them understand unfair abuse from landlords and helping them prepare uh, to make complaints and arguments to get away with all the uh, rents.